and I've been teaching for a year or two now. So I can even remember the days when, you know, you'd, you'd sort of switch on the, the tape recorder and press buttons. You had a whole lesson planned. Uh, and then, of course, everything breaks down and you're suddenly forced back. Anyway, shut up, Jeremy. Get on with it. Right, let's try and share. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, yeah, how about that? Hallelujah. We're on. Um, so, uh, um, and if my... Um, uh, a silly thing will uh, allow me to do this. That's what I want to do. Right, we're off. Okay, so many of you uh, will recognize the, the quote. It's, of course, in Shakespeare's play Hamlet, when Hamlet is instructing uh, the players who are going to perform a play in front of his mother and his, and his uncle, who's bumped off his father and is now um, uh, uh, living with his mother much to his um, and so here's a scene from Kenneth Branagh's film and Kenneth Branagh with his peroxide hair it looks cool and he's talking to the actors saying and he says speak the speech uh, as I I pray you as I pronounce it uh, trippingly upon the tongue and he goes on uh, apparently it was very funny for an Elizabethan audience because he does lots of actor stuff in that speech but the thing that interested me is the second and then then one of the players says we will do it you know and then he says but be not too tame either in other words you know go for it and that seems to me a pretty good mantra for for esl students you know yes it's a tough thing in a foreign language trying to make it work but be not tame be not too tame go for it and then deal with what's coming and so on and so forth now uh, let's let's um, I've recently just finished a book which is coming out soon uh, for Cambridge University Press and it's all about a particular strand of English language teaching uh, which as a as a, a young teacher myself well it happened before I started teaching um, I think this was the 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 the, um, the the sort of quintessential statement of what it was uh, oh we're gonna um, nah, nah, it's too late now uh, stupid me um, the reason I put the Arnolfini portrait there was because I was going to do an activity where I was going to describe the picture and ask you to draw it. Uh, I was going to say, you know, there's a man with a funny hat and a woman with her hand on her belly and a white uh, veil and behind them there's a, there's a mirror uh, and hanging from the ceiling is a sort of chandelier kind of light and between them is a little dog and so on. So I was and they're holding hands. And I was going to describe this picture and ask you to draw it. Um, but there's another thing teachers do. They forget what they're supposed to do and then they screw it up. I just did that. Oh, well. Um, and, and then and I was going to ask you to show me your efforts. And then I was going to show you this picture. It's a very, very famous uh, um, uh, work of art from 1434. It's kind of been around a bit. Um, and the reason I was going to do that is because that was one of the quintessentially uh, um, uh, what's the word I want um, uh, activities uh, that first emerged when people went crazy about communicative activities speaking communicative activities um, and and the philosophy well it best it's best expressed by uh, uh, this guy uh, Dick Allwright and he was teaching in uh, the University of Essex in the United Kingdom and they got these pre-sessional students coming to them uh, very much and, and Leslie used to work with these sort of kind of people a lot um, at the new school uh, where we both worked and um, and your job is to bring their English up to standard to be able to follow their course their maestri their, 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 sorry their master's course or their or whatever it is um, and he, they got fed up these guys with with uh, teaching grammar and vocabulary and all the sort of stuff we do and they sat around and they said, well, we thought that if the language teachers management activities are directed exclusively um, at involving students in solving communication problems, comma, and then this was the big, you know, punch, then language learning will take care of itself. In other words, all you need to do is get students to really use English to solve communication problems. And somehow language learning will magically emerge. Uh, and it's a very seductive philosophy. Oh, gosh, how wonderful. And so uh, as, a, as a young teacher, when I first came across this, 
Um, you know, I stopped teaching grammar straight away. I had all my students doing these activities and, and group work and all this kind of thing. And it was absolutely great. And, 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 uh, and lots of my Latin American students loved it. This was in the UK. But the Germans all came to me and said, we want more grammar. And I'm sorry about the sort of uh, cultural stereotypes, but it sort of worked and so on. Uh, I, I, uh, I overdid it completely. But at the time, uh, one of the first articles I ever had published was about what a communicative activity was. Uh, this was back in, I mean, it's amazing. I was just a child, obviously. This was back in 1982. Uh, and I wrote an article called What is Communicative? And I suggested that um, uh, uh, communicative activities had certain characteristics. Now, what were these communicative activities? Well, there was one for example called Find the Similarities. You have one student with a picture and another student in, in a pair with, with a different picture. And without looking at each other's pictures, they have to find how many differences there are between my picture and my partner's picture. Or the similarities. I have to find five similarities between the picture I've got, which she can't see, and the picture she's got, which I can't see, to find the similarities. Or we put a little divider between us, and I have some shapes, and I put them in a pattern, uh, and, um, and then uh, she has to arrange her shapes in the same pattern. Uh, what were these for? Well, they were all designed to... Um, to uh, uh, oh, and here's another one. Oh, one of the activities that Dick Allwright's guys did uh, was they sent them to the library to, um, to, uh, to find out some really complicated information. Where can I find this? What should I do for that? What should I do for that? And again, the philosophy was that negotiation with the librarian in English, because the librarian couldn't possibly speak all the different languages that, that people spoke, that, that uh, interaction would really help them to learn English. And then one to which I will return later, uh, which was a very early and popular uh, uh, activity, was called jigsaw reading. And this is the one where uh, you give students um, different bits of, say, a reading text. and then they have to without uh, i'll explain in a minute when we get there um, um but they'll have to they have to put the uh reading text back together again by talking to each other not by reading the different bits but by talking to each other and why did we do all these things why were all these things done i should say by dick Allwright and his colleagues all those years ago well um there were six characteristics of this kind of activity. Six, oh, by the way, I need to say that the, one of the reasons that I exaggerated and many of my young colleagues exaggerated was because, you see, the whole point about Dick Allwright is, is that they were teaching at university level. All of their students had quite a lot of English, otherwise they wouldn't have been accepted on a university course in the first place. And they were all in the UK, where, especially in those days, you know, English was ubiquitous all over. Um, it still is, but, but you know, um, of course it is. It's a, an English-speaking country. Uh, um, whereas most of the students in northern Greece or Vietnam or, or, or Russia or Argentina and so on and so forth are not at that level. We teach a lot of kids and beginners and lower intermediate students. So there's a problem, and we'll come to that. What, what, so in the article I wrote way back then, I said that a communicative activity had six characteristics. The first is that the students have a desire to communicate. Unless, they've got a, unless they want to, what's the point? They're not going to. Not with, not, not oomph with all their heart, you know? Um, uh, they must have a reason to communicate. It's not enough just to... Uh, this is what I thought. It's not enough just to sort of say things because the teacher says say things. They must have a reason to communicate, not just to repeat. Um, the emphasis should be on the content of what they're saying, uh, the subject, the topic, the, the, the meaning they want to convey, and not on the form of the language. So if, if, they, if they, they don't spend all their time trying to use, if they're British English speakers, 
not so much if they're American English speakers, uh, they don't spend so much time trying to use present perfect sentences, sentences using the present perfect verb tense. Uh, they, they, that's not what this is about. It's about the content. Um, and especially because of that, we want them to use a variety of language, lots and lots of language. Uh, um, and, and we don't spend all our time correcting them and saying, stop, 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 before you say the thing that you really want to say, I'm going to correct this mistake. Uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and we don't control what they say. You have to do fill in the blank in question one and fill in the blur and the do and, and change. You get the picture. So that was what I thought, and most people thought communicative activities felt like at the beginning of the 1980s, back in back in the Stone Age, and um, and, and that was then. Well. I repeat, um, most students aren't at the level that, that all rights are. Most students, your students, so students particularly in places like Westchester uh, College, are a, a mixture of uh, quite basic English speakers and sort of moving up through the levels intermediate. And some of them are, are pretty advanced, but not all of them. Um, and anyway, uh, it's true that, that if you have um, if you spend all your time communicating, but I mean all your time communicating, uh, then uh, you may very well get the language. Uh, I speak I, I speak Spanish as it happens because I lived in Mexico for quite a few years. It took me quite a long time to get it, you know. And even now, I, I hesitate to say this because I'm obviously perfect, but I make mistakes and things like that because I never studied Spanish. What I'm trying to say is it, it took me a long time but I had a powerful motivation to learn it and so on and so forth. Um, anyway, so when I came more recently to revisit this whole issue, oh, by the way, and here's another thing. Remember the title of this talk, Be Not Too Tame. Uh, an awful lot of students, particularly at the lower levels, uh, it's such a kind of psychologically traumatic thing trying to speak in a foreign language. You feel tongue-tied. You feel that you're you're going to make a fool of yourself. Your personality is on the line. All that kind of thing. There was. I went to a wonderful uh, a talk uh, at a conference. I can't remember where. But and all I remember about the speaker is he was from a place called Sydney. But the, it turns out there's a Sydney in Canada, right? Who knew? Um, he was from Sydney in Canada, and he talked about. Uh, a, a bit like Tennessee Williams' play, Streetcar Named Desire. He talked about communicating in a foreign language. It, you, you're sort of, you, you're, you're somewhere on a climb between desire and terror. You know, desire, I really want to communicate uh, in, in French or Portuguese or, or German or whatever language it is, but I'm terrified. And, and it's, it's it, what he was saying is, is you, you have to move the, the pointer up from the terror through sufficiently to desire where people will go for it. Um, and anyway, I'm not sure that those characteristics of a communicative activity are sufficient for what we want, because what we want in the world of ESL or even EFL, uh, the division is a bit is a bit muddy, I think. It's always been a bit muddy, but, but what we want is more than just uh, communicating. I think we need to redefine uh, those um, characteristics of communicative activities, give them more language learning potential, and also work out how to make them more persuasive for the students who are still stuck on the terror end. So, um, by the way, I'll go on for about another five minutes talking about this, and then we're going to look at some activities which I hope you will agree do some of the things I'm talking about. And here's another thing. Um, all people who speak on webinars have the situation I've got at the moment, which is I, all I can hear is the sound of my voice and I get to hear way too much of that every day. Um, I have no idea how we're getting on over there, um, but I hope you're, you're still there and, um, and everything's okay. Uh, but I'm, I just have to go on uh, with that um, assumption. Right, uh, so here are um, uh, oh, and by the way, the other thing is, that at the moment, I can't see the chat. But as soon as I stop sharing, I'll be able to get a sort of view of that and see where we are. So, uh, here are my revised versions of those characteristics. 
Um, uh, I think we're now talking about effective, and I'm talking about effective in terms of language learners because yes I want my students to communicate and have fun and and love each other and and as I said this in this particular time you know believe in peace and love and all this kind of stuff yes I want that but my job I found them, my job but my basic job I am a language teacher my job is to teach the language I hope I teach brother and sisterhood or, or theyhood as well at the same time uh, but I'm a language teacher. It's language we're after. So what should effective communication be like? Well, uh, effective communication should involve students in deep processing. Is this a term you're familiar with, I wonder? And if it is, uh, well, let me explain. Um, uh, deep processing has got quite a long history um, it's a rather amorphous term and, and it's much easier to talk about in a kind of um, romantic way than it is to define. I'll, 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 um, I'll give you an idea. Here's a guy called, well you can see what he's called, he's called Stephen Chu uh, from uh, Samford University, uh, not Stanford, Samford University. And he teaches, he's a psychology lecturer. And um, somebody told me about this and I went and had a look. This is the second of five mini lectures on YouTube, it, it, I, uh, you can find it on YouTube, in which he quotes, can you believe this, he quotes some research, Hyden Jenkins from 1969, um, uh, which is a year or two ago, uh, and I briefly summarised the research. Uh, it was, but by the way, the, the reason for his little mini lecture, he's in front of him are brand new undergraduate students, freshmen, who are about to start studying for a psychology degree. And so he's trying to explain to them some of the basic tenets of psychology and learning and all this kind of thing, and especially learning about psychology. And this is the Hyden Jenkins experiment he describes. Uh, the subjects were given a list of words, but they were sort of put into four groups. The first group was told nothing. Here's a list of words. The second group were told, here's a list of words. I'm going to test you in mm -mm time to see how many re you remember. The third group were told, here's a list of words. I want you to find the words with the letter I. And the fourth group were told, here's a list of words. I want you to decide which words you like. Now, the most surprising thing about what happened, because then they did see how many words they remembered, for me, the most surprising thing that happened, and it's kind of scary, especially in the, in the huge testing regulated world that much language teaching takes place in, is that um, there, were, there was no difference between the people who were told nothing and the people who were told um, that they were gonna be tested. Didn't make any difference. They remembered about the same number of words. In fact, there was only one group that remembered significantly more words than the other, and I'm sure you've guessed which one it was. It's the group who were told to look at the words and decide which words they loved. They liked, sorry, I didn't say love. Which words they liked. So why was that? Well, the answer, Hayden Jenkins said, as reported by Stephen Chu, is because when you're asked to decide if you like something, you process deeply. You know, you process right down here or here, heart, wherever, you know, you process deeply. Whereas if I tell you, uh, um, look at the words and decide which ones have the letter I, that's not deep, that's shallow. Um, and in case you think it's just 1969, um, I was told about this book by a, a very great friend of mine and Leslie's who I believe did one of these webinars the other day called Scott Thornbury um, and um, he told me about this book. I, I don't know if anyone's come across it. Um, he's an emeritus professor of psychology um, called Stephen Coslin and if you've read it uh, you'll know what I'm going to say to you and I apologize for repeating it but if you haven't um, so, and it's kind of a cool book, um, Active Learning Online, Five Principles That Make Online Courses Come Alive. Yes! He describes an experiment he does 
with his new undergraduate students sitting for the first time in a lecture theatre. He gives them a list of words which includes these. And he puts them in pairs, A and B. He doesn't tell them why. Then he says, okay, now, A, I would like you to look at these words and run through them and just find out which words are taller at the beginning of the word than at the end. So, for example, frog is taller at the beginning because F has a serif or whatever you call it, and G doesn't. Uh, um, but B, I want you to look at these words and decide which words describe something that is alive. That's it. And after about 20 seconds, he gives them no more than about 20, 25 seconds. He says, right, how many words can you remember? And just as with that piece of research in 1969, you've guessed it. The people who had to work out that frog was taller at the beginning than at the end didn't remember nearly as many, or that rat wasn't taller at the beginning than the end. Neither is sheep, neither is deer, neither but brick is and hug. Those people didn't remember nearly oops nearly as many words as the students who were um, uh, um, told to find out which words represent something that's alive deep processing 2021 it was at the time deep processing in action persuasive action so that's the first characteristic we're talking about we need to engage students hearts as well as their heads we need their heads by the way too we'll talk about that in a minute but we need their hearts when we said when i said in 1982 a desire to communicate that is i mean it's real strong desire i don't mean it's that kind of desire that's another thing but i mean this kind of deep processing desire where things happen at the kind of heart emotional level here's the second thing this is a, a scene from a London production that I went to uh, some time ago um, of one of the great classics of 20th century American theatre. This is uh, Eugene O'Neill's Long Day's Journey Into Night. Cheerful play. Um, the dads are bullied, um, the mother's a morphine addict, one son's dying of consumption and the other wants to leave home. It's great. It's, we'll laugh a minute. Um, the most extraordinary thing about the play is it is just endless tragedy and yet it's completely compelling. Uh, and in and in uh, this is the, that's a guy called David Suchet and I, a Catherine Holmes I think her name is are the two actors and the the production I saw was absolutely extraordinary I mean it's just it, it, it kind of nailed me to my seat it was just heart wrenching and beautiful and over the top stupendous uh, you know and you leave that you leave uh, the theatre with with exactly what you want from great drama you feel purged and and uh, you know what I'm talking about and it occurred to me as it occurs to anyone who's ever acted professionally or, or in an amateur way that what I had seen was different from what the audience had seen last night or tomorrow and yet these guys are repeating exactly the same lines every single night but they don't quite mean the same every single night because something different is happening yes they mean the same but Claire Cramsh uh, uh, expressed it, it better. Utterances repeated are also re-signified, which I glossed to uh, uh, to mean they're given new, nuanced meaning. They have a, a new meaning. The repetition really matters, but each time you repeat, if you're processing deeply at the same time, you give those words a kind of new, a new taste new smell new meaning so uh, a good effective communicative activity provokes purposeful repetition where the utterances are re-signified the third one is the same pretty much as one of those 1982 characteristics uh, we, we need to encourage students to process language for meaning not just form I'm rushing because I want to get through to the the, the practical aspect of this. Um, um, we want to uh, provoke students to give attention, to make connections between the language they encounter and the context. Um, not just uh, isolated sentences, you know, six sentences with the present simple. Nothing wrong with that. 
but I want them to be making connections between different bits of language. Um, uh, and we want to um, uh, engage interaction between the language processing and the stories and the language they hear. And crucially, of course, and this was always part of the deal, uh, we want uh, uh, to promote interaction between students, the sharing, the, 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 the interactive uh, uh, um, crunch, if you like, between different students, which will help this work. So which of these activities um, are, are effective in that sense? Um, here is um, uh, an activity which is as old as the hills. Um, but some years ago, when I was in Bucharest in Romania, I interviewed a young teacher, a lovely young teacher, who, was, who described to me a successful lesson. I, I would ask students, can you describe a successful lesson you learnt recently? Um, and she did. Uh, her name is Andrea uh, Dragici from Romania. As you can see, she must be, what, 23 or something like that? Very young. Um, and um, when she described, uh, like all teachers, and I had a camera on her, as you can see, and um, I said, describe a successful lesson. And she said, mm -hmm. I said, go on, go on. You must have had at least one successful lesson. And she started talking about her lesson and her face lit up like all teachers do. And all any good teacher, any teacher worth their salt, when they start talking, about a successful lesson, suddenly they're not talking about themselves at all. They're talking about what the students did, what the students achieved. And so uh, very quickly, and, and there are countries where I wouldn't recommend this particular topic at all, uh, and you'll know what I mean. So she started and said, there's a man in a bar and, uh, uh, and he's drinking. And, and the question is, is he going to have another drink or not? Because if he drinks, if he drinks another, if he has another drink, if he has another drink, he will. If he has another drink, he will. And she elicits, get drunk. So if he has another drink, he'll get drunk. And then the next student has to say, using the second half of that first conditional sentence, if he gets drunk, he will get home late. And then, this were her words, not mine. I, I hope that I'm not so gender um, uh, um, in prison. But, but the, the student came up with a sentence, if he gets home late, using the second half of that, that last sentence, his wife will be cross. Okay, that's a student saying this. If his wife will be cross, says the next student, if it does, and then I shoot myself. If his wife is cross, uh, he will get cross too. It doesn't matter what they say and it doesn't matter that this story is already not a very good story. That's not the point. The point is the students are generating the language. They're getting their uh, repetition. They're doing it with a, a, a degree of deep processing. Uh, they don't care as much as they would care if they were genuinely talking about they wanted to declare love for somebody or something. But the processing is deep. They're, they're interacting with each other. But we're not throwing them into the swimming pool without any ability to swim. This is very controlled. And for students who are still at the terror end of that terror to, to uh, desire, we've moved them a bit beyond in, into the desire region. And, and things, things are good because it's funny. Everybody knows it's silly. Uh, and there's nothing too bad going on. So that's one uh, way of satisfying the six characteristics without asking people, to, I don't know, to have a debate in front of a thousand people. This is, this is much more uh, um, uh, controlled in that sense, but I would argue that it's an effective communicative activity because it seems to me to represent many of the characteristics that I was talking about. However, if we just stayed at this level, I'd be a bit disappointed. Presumably we can do more. Uh, aha, speed dating. Do you remember speed dating? Uh, do people still do it, speed dating? It was sort of hugely popular around the millennium or something like that. And, you know, people would go to speed dating parties and things like that. 
now they use Tinder or something. Shock horror. I, I, um, I, funnily enough, um, someone here had a, a, a TV program on which some of you may have seen uh, this morning called The Tinder Swindler. And um, uh, uh, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's a horrible program, and it's, but it's, it's sort of grotesquely addictive and it's about a very unpleasant man. Anyway, neither here nor there. Uh, speed dating. Uh, my understanding is that speed dating sort of grew out of a, a, of a, a US custom. Uh, was it New Year's Day or something like that? And and uh, and and supposedly, supuestamente, I've no idea whether this is true. Um, you know, young men would visit uh, women's homes and be given a kind of mini interview to see. Uh, it's probably rubbish, but that's what I that's what I read. I read it on I googled it and I read it online, so it must be true. Um, anyway, so uh, uh, speed dating is a really great. Uh, uh, class activity and here is a, a picture of, from one of my books this is a still from a video from the a, um, a 2007 edition of a book called the practice of English language teaching in which a teacher that's Laura standing on the chair um, which she would never do in Korea of course you don't stand on chairs but anyway but it, but but there she is and the students there are speed dating in their English language class um, and um, uh, it got a bit, it was very funny because there's one guy there, you, you can't quite see, oh, he's the guy with his back to you in the pink shirt, pink thing. But he got terribly upset because because of the numbers, he at one stage had to be pretend to be a woman and this he found that very difficult. But hey, that's his problem. Um, so, um, uh, and it's great fun because speed dating really works. Uh, in, uh, no, no, I don't mean speed dating really works. I've no idea whether speed dating really works. I've never done it. But speed dating... For in, in this kind of educational setting, this language learning session is terrific. Why? Because you get um, you get uh, lots of constant purposeful repetition. The whole idea is you have to ask the same questions to each person. So you get to repeat the questions each time. So we've got the repetition. Uh, the idea, in case you don't remember what it's all about, is you've only got maximum three minutes. And in a class, we can make that even shorter to ask each person that you interview the same questions but it's purposeful and you want to do it because it's fun it's purposeful because at the end you have to say I choose him or I choose her or something like that and so on and it's fun and if you've got a really good relationship with your students you can do it without anyone getting hurt or offended or anything else like that um, and and Laura uh, uh, there um, I mean she was just the most a beautiful young teacher I don't mean I'm not talking about her physical beauty I'm talking about her relationship with with her uh, but beauty is in the eye of the beholder after all I'm talking my description of her as beautiful is about the relationship she had with her students there was a really wonderful sort of uh, community uh, working there but I sort of worried about it I worry it's a bit kind of weird to get your students doing this activity to to um, uh, is it is it? I don't know, but I mean, it could be a bit wrong. And then the other day I listened to uh, a radio interview with this man called Tim, um, oh God, what's his name, Tim Peake, is it? Um, anyway, we're very proud of him in Britain because he's, he's, um, he's uh, the one of only two British people to have gone to space. Okay, if you're over there in the US, about five million people have gone to space. It's just like, what am I going to do today? Oh, I'll just go to space. But in Britain, you know, we're a bit backward in Britain. Um, okay, no, we're not. We're not. I didn't mean that. Uh, anyway, so this this guy um, uh, uh, spent six months or so on uh, the space station. There he is. Um, but I heard him talking about. He was one of of hundreds of of applica applicants for this to get on the space station. Um, and um, and it turned out when he got down to the last two or three, he spent time with one of the trainers, and they just hung out together. And at the end, uh, when he got back from space, he asked this guy, "Why did you choose me?" And the guy said, "Well, because I reckon I could, I could, I could bear being stuck with you in a small space for six months more than any of the others." Um, so I think space station speed dating is much more fun than speed dating speed dating what three questions four questions would you ask to the people you were considering if you had to spend 
six months with them in a, a small space, you know, like, like a, mini, a small flat. What six questions would you ask? Uh, and um, uh, three questions, how I come. Um, and so the students prepare their questions. We go around the, we go around the, 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 the group, making sure their questions make sense and helping them get the right kind of questions. What are you trying to ask? That kind of thing. And then they have this time, three minutes, two minutes, I don't know. And you put them in circles like you saw Laura doing, outer circle and then the inner circle uh, uh, facing the outer circle. And they interview all the people and then you just, you just shift the outer circle or the inner circle one. So they interview the next person and then the next person and the next person. Uh, and, um, and at the end they have to make a choice. Who are you going to take onto the space station? We've taken away the kind of the love and sex and romance and just made it into something very, very kind of practical and things like that. Um, I reckon that works really well. We've got some deep processing because you're trying to uh, make a decision based on content. Um, we've got purposeful repetition. Um, how's, you know, how's Claudia going to reply to my questions? So will that be different from, from Leslie? And what will Judy say when I talk to her? Hello, Judy, if you're listening. And, and so on and so forth. Um, and that seems to work for me. And now it's a little less uh, structured than that student generated drill we started with. It's where we're, we're taking the brakes off a little bit uh, here. Here's another activity. Um, now, uh, I said, um, uh, um, that when when um, Dick Allwright and his colleagues were uh, uh, doing these communicative activities, communicative activities, way back in the nineteen early nineteen eighties or something, way way back, um, and then there was uh, two people called Marion um, Geddes and Jill Sturtridge who published two books around that time about jigsaw reading and jigsaw listening. How does it work? I will give you a demonstration. Now this is a true story which took place in um, Brooklyn Heights or somewhere like that. Uh, it's a true story. And what I've done is, uh, and, and I read this story, an interview um, uh, with this woman. And um, so I wrote the story so it was, I rewrote the story so that it was appropriate for intermediate students. And then, as I said to you, I chop the story into a series of jigsaw pieces. All the students start by seeing this paragraph. Oh, by the way, that's the woman in question. And, and the reason for that uh, uh, image will become clear as we go on. So this is the first uh, paragraph that the whole class reads. And I'll just give you a bit of time also a rest from my voice. I'll give you a bit of time just to read it. And then when the students have read it, we have a little discussion and we allow them to speculate about what's going, what's this, what's this all about? You know, who's, why was she an angel? Who are Dylan's parents? Why was she meant to be there? Where, what is it? And so on and so forth. So they speculate. But now we separate the students into uh, six groups or five groups. We'll find out in a minute. I've completely forgot. Into five groups. Uh, um, and each group gets a different jigsaw piece. So here's the next, so one group over here on my left, one group gets this. Uh, um, uh, no, we've already had that, go away. Uh, one group gets this one. And it tells you that she looked up, the baby was lying on his tummy on the railings and the fire escape looking, he seemed perfectly happy and unaware of the danger. Uh, she picked up the, the phone and called 911. Some people were going into the, into the, um, apartment building to get the baby's parents, the whole drum, blah, 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 blah. So that's what this group gets. But what's that, what, what's that, how is that related to her being an angel and that kind of thing? What happened? The next group 
gets this. Uh, so it's all about Christina Torre. Interesting, the spelling of her name seems to have changed. Um, I imagine if it's a name like Torre, it should probably be Christina without an H. But who will say? Anyway, Christina Torre was in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn that day. She was going to visit a friend who had a newborn. Uh, you know. So she's visiting a friend who's just had a baby. She she goes to, she buys the, the 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 baby a little present. Very excited. To, you know, when your friends have a new baby, it's a very exciting moment to go visit. Um, uh, and then she um, she when she li used to live there. She, she stopped by a cupcake shop as she'd often gone to in the past and she bought a coffee and she was outside having a coffee and a cupcake and then some guy comes up to rather creepy uh, for a guy to come up with you and say, do you have a phone? But he said, could you possibly um, call 911? There's a baby on the, uh, on the fire escape. Uh, here's what the next group gets. Dylan let go of the railing and fell. His face had a protruding plastic sign. Um, everyone gasped. But she had positioned herself directly under the fire escape. She was in exactly the right spot. So when the baby fell, he landed in her outstretched arms. He felt almost weightless, Christina said. There was blood on his face, but it was only from his lip that had been cut from the sign. And a man who'd been watching the incident took the baby from her. Christina didn't move. Maybe she was in shock. This is what the next group gets. Uh, the baby slipped. As he fell, he grabbed onto the railing. And for a moment, he hung there. Imagine this little baby hanging there, 25 feet. But as Christina told the person on the other end of the line, he wouldn't be able to hang on for long. She was watching what was happened. But at that moment, she suddenly felt very calm. She knew what to do. Yeah. Uh, she found out later that this 16-month-old Dylan, that was the baby's name, had crawled through a space between some pieces of cardboard on the sides of the air conditioning unit, which was set in the window of the apartment. He'd escaped through the window without injury. Um, and, and there we are. That's the story. Now, um, don't, don't be distracted by what it says on the screen. I should have left a blank um, slide there. Um, so what we do now is we take the jigsaw pieces away from the groups and we get a student from group A, a student from group B, a student from group C, a student, uh, sorry, a stu uh, start again, they, we've all read A, we take a student from group B, a student from group C, a student from group D, and a student from group E, and we put them into new little groups of four students, and we say, okay, now work out the whole story. Work out the whole story. And, uh, they do and we sort of encourage them and we you know and then when they've worked out the story we listen to the stories see if all the groups have the same story uh, uh, and discuss it and so on and so forth um, that's jigsaw reading that's a, a, a an example of jigsaw reading if you want to see the real story um, if you google um, I caught a falling baby I caught a falling baby uh, and you also type in Guardian for the British uh, uh, newspaper well it's not paper but you know what I mean the British newspaper The Guardian you'll see Christina Torres story uh, um, and it, it's absolutely compelling and uh, uh, she goes on to say that after you know when it was all over she got uh, got on the subway and then suddenly when she was on the subway she just kind of completely fell apart and started weeping and stuff like that and I don't know if any of you have ever experienced delayed shock but it happened to me once in, in a not dissimilar incident and uh, it's absolutely extraordinary delayed shock you, you, there's nothing you can do about it you just go to pieces and then it passes anyway now why do I like that well it seems to me to have the characteristics the repetition really works because you, I've read my jigsaw piece and I have to keep repeating the information I read there to the people in the group. And everyone's repeating things and hearing the same things and putting it all together until all the pieces <coughs> interlock and stuff like that. Uh, it's deep processing. It's quite a story, by the way. Um, uh, it's, it's quite powerful. You know, if, you've ever, if you have even the, the mildest positive feelings about babies, uh, and it's very difficult not to, uh, 
you can't help but be moved by that story. Um, uh, it's kind of a mystery, but you know you'll be able to solve it. Uh, and you trust your teacher as well. Um, and and so on. Uh, um, so you've got repetition, you've got uh, deep processing, you've got interaction, you, you're, you're focusing on the content, not the form. Uh, you have to process language in the context of other language that because you're talking to other people and listening with a special attention to what they're saying and so on and so forth. So now we've we've got the we, we've taken away even more controls uh, and so on and so forth. And I've got one more activity. I've, I've, I have absolutely no idea. Oh, my God, we're nearly finished, aren't we? Um, but I'll do one more quick activity. And then if anyone's got time, we'll stick around for a little bit. Is that OK, Claudia? Um, okay, um, so uh, uh, very quickly, uh, you say to, I'll, I'll just quickly describe this, you say to students, um, you, where you're going to judge, um, you're, you work for a museum and you're going to select uh, uh, a black and white photograph from the 20th century, um, which shows uh, uh, people in, in um, uh, um, urgent situations or, or you know, and, um, you're going to have to choose the one to hang on the wall. So first of all, what you ask students to do is decide on their criteria for choosing. So they have a discussion. Different groups have a discussion, deciding on the criteria. And when they've decided on the criteria, uh, you say, OK, now I'm going to sh you're going to look at four photographs. Uh, and the one you choose must answer all your criteria. And here are four photographs for you. Now, uh, they're all some of them are very, very famous. Um, that that's the famous depression uh, um, photograph by her. You know who I mean. Um, uh, anyway, um, I, it's it's uh, that photograph always worries me because um, uh, it's it's very difficult. Uh, uh, it it attracts me as a work of art, and yet what it portrays is 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 need and misery and pathos, and I'm very worried about finding that. Um, um, uh, an amazing image. Uh, the one uh, picture C there is a very famous uh, um, Brazilian photograph of four guys on a roof in Sao Paulo in Brazil years ago, uh, and I, I love it because it's mystery. What are they doing there? Is that are they kind of four kind of mafiosi? Are they are they are, are they businessmen? Are, are they about to throw someone off the roof? What they're doing and so on and so forth. Um, uh, picture B is one of the most iconic. Uh, uh, pictures ever, 1956, Little Rock, Arkansas, and that amazingly poised 16-year-old Elizabeth Eckford in the foreground, and behind her is uh, Barbara, what's her face, um, who who has says all her life since then has said, you know, yes, I was a I was a repulsive kind of racist teenager um, back then, um, but my life's more than a moment. You know, I'm not the same person anymore. They they've met as as uh, old women, these two now, uh, and tried to heal that wound. Um, uh, Sebastian uh, Counts was the photographer and the only reason he got in there um, was because he was an ex-pupil of, of the Little Rock High School um, himself and of course it was on seeing uh, um, those photographs from that time that Eisenhower sent in the National Guard and so on and so forth. Uh, and then and then the, the last picture is, is an extraordinary picture of a returning prisoner of war from Vietnam uh, finally released and that's his family rushing towards him and his teenage daughter just you know out of the park excited and thrilled to see him um, and his wife behind they got divorced later but that's another story um, but um, so which one would you choose uh, and they have the discussion and now we've reached a much more uh, um, a much freer conversational thing and in tomorrow's talk, uh, <laughs> in tomorrow's talk, we'll um, discuss what you do with what you hear as teachers. Uh, uh, but I'm going to stop now and see if we. I'm so sorry. I've tried to get through it all and see if we've got enough time. So I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, boom. No, I haven't. I haven't stopped yet. Uh, try again. No, go go away. Uh, 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 Ah, good. Uh, right. Have I stopped sharing? Yes, I have. Okay. Uh, um, 
Right. Um, I, do, I can see Judy there. Hello, Judy. Um, uh, there's um, uh, Claudia, uh, far away. Um, Thank you so much, Jeremy. Uh, if you want to take some questions, maybe from our audience. Can I just say before I say I've just I've just now I can see the chat and the first thing I've seen the very first thing I've seen in the chat I don't know if it's addressed to me is do you snore? <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to answer that. Um, okay, is there anyone anyone like to say something? Is there anyone who'd like to comment? Is there anyone who'd like to disagree or agree or whatever? You know. I have a question. Yeah, who's that? That's yeah, Lynn Laurie. Hi. Oh, there. Hi, hi, Lynn. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, I had a question. So with the pictures, um, so they look at the pictures and then they have to like find one that fits certain criteria. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So okay. you say to them, look, you, you, you it, it doesn't have to be photographs. It could be anything, essentially, but they have to come up with a criteria they will use for the task that you give them. In this case, choosing photographs. Okay. And then, and then they have to choose. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, those those are the four photographs I chose in that particular case because I think they're all photographs of interest in one way or other. Um, uh. Jeremy, hello, a pleasure to be here today. Hello, uh, Andrea. Andrea from Argentina. I would like to know how would you define communication? <laughs> um, okay, well. Um, this will take about a week. No, sorry, that's that's that that's a silly comment. Um, uh, communication for me is uh, where meaning and emotion are communicated between people. Uh, now, of course, you can do that um, by nothing more than facial expression i mean you know when people fall in love they just look at each other and you'd have to argue that that's communication in big time but i repeat we're language teachers so my uh, i would revise what i just said communication is where people manage to exchange information and feelings through the medium of language uh, and by language, I mean not just the words and the grammar, but also all the super segmental stuff. And um, you know, and yes, the gestures and the expressions and and the intonation and the, and all that kind of stuff. Does that make sense, Andre? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, amazing. Thank you. Um, um, I hope I hope you're having a great time in a, in our beautiful Argentina. Yeah. Uh, Anybody There's else? A question in the chat from Daria. Um, she says, I was wondering what we can do if students don't have enough language to say, explain which photo they choose for the gallery. Is there a stage when we supply them with the language they lack, post task, uh, task repetition? If I understand that that, que that question correctly, um, that's the kind of conundrum and the and the and the mystery that people have been trying to solve forever. So, for example, um, uh, you know, way back in the nineteen 70s or something like that uh, you had currents you know you had community language learning which was an attempt to resolve that and there is still one or two community language learning kind of programs in new york i think um and the idea of communicative the com community language learning is is you have a, uh, say you have a small group of students who all have different home languages or and, and but each student has someone who can uh, translate and so uh, um, I, I want to, um, I can only speak Spanish, so Claudia is my kind of uh, mentor, my helper. Uh, and I say to her, I want to say, um, where do you live? I say to her in Spanish, so she says, where do you live? Where do you live? Where do you live? And now I say, where do you live? For, for um, a Vietnamese student over there. And they have someone to help them to understand my question and to give them the English they need to to answer it now i mean that's a bit of a of a of a gross simplification of what community language learning was but that was an attempt to answer that conundrum uh, but if i understand the the the, the uh, question right um what i tried to do in, in in the presentation is say at the beginning you start with tasks 
uh, that are very pretty controlled where you sort of the students are equipped with the language they need to perform a very simple task and then as they become more competent that's not the word yes competent as as uh, well as their language linguistic resources uh, broaden out um, you can start relaxing that kind of language input for them is that is that the kind of question uh, claudia because I, I couldn't see it I, I think you uh, touched on it yes um and daria i don't uh let's see was it yes if oh, there's like, i've seen it follow, she said follow it, follow it. It, sorry i'm sorry to interrupt you is there a stage when we supply them with the language they lack post task uh, we do task repetition uh, Daria, I'm sure you know very well. I mean, uh, uh, here's a fascinating thing that happened when we all got very excited in in the uh, what was it the, the 1990s or the 2000s about task-based learning, and there were two sort of strands of task-based learning. No one could quite work out which way to go. One of them said, uh, um, "You set the students a task." Uh, this is a direct answer to Daria. Uh, you set the students a task. And before the task, you make sure they have enabling language in order to perform the task. And then they perform the task. Another strand of task-based learning um, uh, was uh, you don't do any of that that kind of um, that 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 kind of uh, seeding at all. You just say, "Here's the task, do it." And when it's over, then you deal with the language that came up. And you work on that language, uh, and you uh, and you um, uh, and and you do language work, and maybe uh, you do task repetition, because there is a school of thought. There's the famous what is it called sort of four to one idea, where you get students, uh, you give them four minutes or something, uh, maybe that's too long, to say something, and then they have to say exactly the same thing in three minutes, and then in two minutes, and then in one minute, and that. The idea of that kind of task repetition is that each time they repeat it, their 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 language focus becomes you know more and more tightened up, and it'll really really help them. So uh, I think the answer to, I would say um, uh, um, uh, my answer to Daria would be you know um, um, how long is a piece of string sort of thing? I I, I don't know. Um, uh, I'm very taken with. Um, uh, uh, sorry, brain brain freeze moment. Um, I'll remember his name in, a, in a, oh, a Bill Bill um, Bill, one of the great communicative writers from way back. Um, uh, uh, sorry, I can't remember his surname. Um, he said, "Look, let's be quite clear. Most most communicative based uh, methodologies, ideas, techniques, they all have the same thing at their heart, which is trying to get students to learn." through communication. Uh, uh, they go about it in different ways. Um, my feeling about, is, uh, it's, it's, here's another sort of thing, it's this thing about, you know, if, if you, um, uh, um, uh, oh, uh, Andrea, we'll, I'll come back to that, your question. Um, uh, it's, it's like saying, you know, when students are reading a text, should you give them any pre-vocabulary to read? Well, I could make a, you know, which to help them, and I could make a convincing argument for saying no, you should not. But I can make an equally convincing argument for saying yes, you should. And that's the problem about teaching language is is that, you know, it ain't no science. You can do as much research as you want to try and find things out, but 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 um, there's that wonderful uh, the, the Canadian writers who say you know the problem about applied linguistic research for language teachers is. Uh, it's quite difficult to find people who really agree with each other on the same topic uh, because we're dealing you know I, I, this is a cliche we're, we're dealing with um, an art as much as a science art is uh, art is uh, it's giving ourselves too many graces really but we're dealing with a with, with a with a kind of human process as much as we are with the science now I'm probably talking absolute CRAP because um, you know, if if AA if AI can can um, can can learn how to do these things, then it can learn how to do these things. But it'd be really interesting to know whether whether an AI language teacher 
you know, an artificially intelligent language teacher would be any more competent at making the kind of decisions that we're forced to make every second of a classroom. What's the best thing to do now? What should I do now? What do I do now? The best we can do, I think, is to inform ourselves about what's out there, the research that's out there, what our colleagues do, what everyone else does, what we learned on a teacher training course, and then get the experience and just, you know, what's the most important things uh, teachers ever do? And the answer is listen and watch and be aware. And, and an awful lot of what we do, I guess it's the same for doctors really, is making a judgment call time and time again based on uh, experience uh, of what has happened in the past. But experience on its own isn't enough. You need experience um, uh, uh, leavened by real thought about what happened. Um, here's another question for you in the chat um, from Nick Hill. Uh, you have convincingly conveyed the importance of communicative activities. Any suggestion on a good balance between grammar exercises and communicative activities in our classes? My heart tells me just not to teach grammar at all, uh, because you know what? Um, uh, uh, but my head tells me that's that's a romantic notion. Um, uh, I have absolutely no idea how to answer that question. And once again, um, once again, um, uh, read different people, and you will get different answers. But what I do know. Um, uh, oh, by the way. Uh, funny enough, the first time I ever went to Bulgaria, uh, this was such an experience for me, and I, most of you will have had an experience similar. It was just after the wall, the Berlin Wall came down, just after, um, gosh, that seems funny in retrospect based on what's been happening in the last few days. But uh, so the country was opening up uh, to the West in, in, in um, a way that. Um, it hadn't for all those years in the Soviet Union. Um, uh, and it was an, one of the best conferences I've ever been to. The, the bloke who spoke before me he was the prime minister. It was that kind of, it was that kind of feeling of, of excitement and liberation. But the reason I mention it is because I met all these people who spoke perfect English. Really perfect English. And they'd never been outside uh, the Soviet Union. They'd never been to an English-speaking country. Uh, they had almost universally never had, uh, uh, and this is a, a key issue, uh, a native English speaker teacher or anything like that. And we could have a long discussion about that, especially in the context of someone like somewhere like New York and where all the teachers come from in Westchester, all that kind of stuff. Um, they'd done it all with methodology, which in, in 2022 terms, looks pretty much prehistoric dinosaur dinosaur methodology um, but they did it uh, uh, and, and and sometimes their speech sounded a bit a bit Shakespeare to be honest um, but but you know how extraordinary that is um, I I went to France for the first time when I was about 17 having studied French at school for only about a year and a bit uh, grammar translation, la plume de ma tante est plus grande que le jardin de mon oncle. Uh, and, and within about the first, first, um, yeah, the, Daria, exactly, that's what I was doing. Um, um, and you, you did that at uni as well, she says. And, and for the first week I was in Montpellier in the south of France, I was, I was mute. I couldn't say a word. And the second week I spoke French. And, and, you know, my only explanation for that is that, you know, having that, grammar translation hammered into my skull um, sort of did the trick but I know that it didn't do the trick for lots of the other kids in the in the same class uh, it's a really difficult one I'm pretty certain that I would apply to grammar teaching most of the characteristics I said just now which is you've got to make You've got to get the students processing the grammar deeply in some way or other. You've got to get them to invest their heart and soul with what's going on. Uh, if you're going to, um, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, I've just seen a message from Andrea. I have no idea what passenger is. Oh, messenger. I'll see if I can find it, Andrea. Um, so, um, uh, 
I, I just know there are ways of teaching grammar which don't work. And they're mostly ways where I go back, where the, pro, the processing is shallow and the students aren't there. They aren't investing. They aren't completely deeply engaged with what's going on. How much grammar should you teach? As little as possible, as much as you need. <laughs> Sorry, that's a really rubbish answer. But it, you know, but. Should we take one last question from Sundar? Sangha, you want to unmute? Hello. Is that Sangha? Yeah, Ibrahim? it's me. Yeah, it's okay. me. Good, good, good evening. Um, good evening. I'm here. It's evening right now. Where are you speaking from? Uh, I, I am. I am from Iraqi Kurdistan. My language, my my native language is Kurdish. Oh wow! Well, well yeah, welcome. Yeah. I spent two years in the UK for doing my MI, and I spent uh, some years in the USA for for doing my PhD successfully. So, what was your what was uh, your what was your topic and for your doctorate? Um, for uh, the role of language in nation building. Wow, wow! Yeah. I, I want yeah. to read it. What can I do for I, you? What, what's your question? And so my question here is just, I, I would like to say hello to everyone. Um, before asking my question, just give me a few seconds to say something. One of the participants here is Daria. I think she is with us right now, but her name is fully Kurdish, Daria. So Daria in my language is uh, means C. So I'm supposed that it is a sea of knowledge. I'm supposed to. Okay. Um, so I, I teach students at university. Okay. I, I make an asset uh, in a state university in my country. So most of the uh, most of my students are Kurdish students. So when they at uh, they come to university, they do not know how to use English language because the first language in primary and high school is here is Kurdish. So do you think that while teaching, performing code switching is beneficial for them or not, even for a short time? I, I do have an answer to that, one which I think I can be more definite than I've been in some of my other answers. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, if you if you try and stop students from from code switching and translating, it ain't going to work, especially at lower levels. Because yeah, what yeah. happens when you learn language is, th is that um, you spend all your time translating in your head, if nowhere else. Um, yeah, and what yeah. happens to all of us who learn a language is that as you start moving through the levels, there's that, you know, I, I don't want to use an old cliche, but you know, the first dream you have in, yeah. in my first dream in Spanish was like, wow, you know, this is, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. You know, so that yeah. now, uh, just as for all of you who speak two, three, four, eight languages, you don't have to think about what you're gonna say, you just say it. And I mean, you may get it wrong. So people yeah. are gonna do it anyway. Uh, yeah. uh, and it would make no sense um, not to uh, approach, not not to take advantage of that, not to, not right. to, um, I, I think I'd have a sort of the same answer as I said about grammar. To deny students the ability to code switch, especially where that is helpful uh, yeah. for the um, uh, smooth running of a class or the disambiguation uh, the explanation of meaning is is crazy to me, yeah. uh, but but I also and I I've, again I'm going to tell a personal anecdote. Uh, when I was living in Mexico and I started getting Spanish, I was teaching in Mexico, so I started speaking Spanish in the class because I was so proud of myself. Um, it was pathetic, and then I did I spoke too much, and then suddenly I, I woke up one morning and thought this is ridiculous. I this isn't this isn't my Spanish language class. This is their English class. In other words, um, as as much as is necessary, only if it's necessary and helpful, yeah. but as little oh, as yeah. possible. How does that sound yeah. to you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, it's good. So personally, I uh, every time I tell my uh, colleagues that it's better to do um, code switching when our students are in the first year of study just to motivate them but code switching should not be done for uh, a long time maybe in every class just for one or two minutes or just to translate some difficult words or terms in order to understand them 
um, to to uh, understand the meaning of someone just so quickly in a short time, I think. But I totally okay. agree with you. After the first year of study, it's not good to do code switching. Yes, thank you however, so much. For however, I must, I must yeah, just, yeah. I just want to do, give you a counter, uh, on, a counter opinion. Um, yeah. I went for a, 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 some filming I was involved in. I went to the Middle East Technical University in, in, uh, in Ankara in Turkey, and um, yeah. they have a, pri a primary school on site. Um, yeah. And they they have uh, a policy there, which is nobody speaks Turkish yeah. in the school. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, in the English language department. No one speaks yeah. Turkish. So much so that yeah. this one teacher, uh, she made me laugh. She said, when the kid came along to parents evening, yeah. the student nearly fell off their chair when her her teacher started speaking Turkish because she didn't think she could speak Turkish because she'd only ever spoken in English because that school has a policy that they will only only speak English uh, yeah. because that way supposedly uh, the kids will be an entirely in an English environment and that's that's what they will grow up doing now I'm agnostic I I, I don't have a I don't have a firm view either way yeah. but so if i did have a view it's the one i expressed to you before uh, so could could i ask you uh, another question uh, yes for sure um, uh, it's up to claudia you. to see how long we're going to go on for there uh, that's, uh, okay i will finish my my questions in a short time so do you know why sometimes we do code switching for our first year students because the system of admitting students here in my country uh, at university is according to uh, the the graduate the, uh, the students high school markets so you know that in most of the countries in the world st students are admitted at some university or at some departments according to their interests right but mm -hmm. here students are admitted at university according to their graduated high uh, uh, high school markets so therefore some of them, uh, can't speak English very well, but I think it's better to encourage them in order to 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 like the department, to like the language, not to hate the language. Therefore, sometimes we we do some code switching. I might, I've, can I tell one last little story because it makes me laugh? I, yeah, I read this article. Course, course. I, yeah, I, read I like, this article. I like it. I, I read this article. Um, it was about uh, discipline in Japanese schools. Yeah. Um, and this was years ago. Uh, it was a very interesting article because, of course, Japanese students, when they behave badly, behave badly in very different ways from, say, British kids. But we won't go into that. In the course of that, the, the authors uh, quoted some research into the teaching of Latin uh, in, the, in the Middle Ages, the published research at the time. And they discussed a method where you would have the Latin teacher and if a student used their vernacular, their home language in class, they would be beaten on their hands as a punishment. But the bit which makes me scream with laughter and also want to kill everybody is that the person who beat them on the hand was not the teacher. It was a local person. And the reasoning was that if the teacher had beaten them on the hand, it would develop a negative attitude towards Latin. Whereas since it was a local person, this wouldn't happen. And I offer that to you as my final word on an extraordinary piece of educational thinking. Make of it what you will. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy. And thank you for your generosity with your, you know, with your time. I see we're, 